this passage of scripture reminds us that we can negotiate with God on behalf of somebody we love. Lot was loved by Abraham, but he didn't live in a place that Abraham lived. As a matter of fact, Lot reminds me of America. He, he lived in a place filled with sin, but yet he had a cord of righteousness. Abraham is, is here pleading on his nephew's behalf. And not just his nephew, but he negotiates with God. If you could just find 50, would you spare the city? And, and, and we have this problem against sin today in the world. We, we talk about folk. We judge folk. But are we interceding for folk? Are we looking for the righteous amongst the wicked? Are we willing to go down and get down on our faces and get down on our knees? And are we willing to pray for somebody else other than ourselves? Somebody else's situation rather than our situation? Are you willing to be Abraham? But before you can be an Abraham, you got to have a relationship with God for yourself because and God visited Abraham is God visiting you Abraham yes Lord I have heard that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah are doing all kinds of ill will. I'm going to see for myself if those people are really that bad. And if so, I will see if they are worthy of life. A lot of this family lives in Sodom. They're good people. I have to do something. I have to do something. Lord, will you destroy all of the evil people Will you also destroy those who are good? I mean, would you spare the city? If there were 50 good people in it? If I find 50 good people inside the city, I won't destroy it. Lot is sitting amongst all kinds and manners evil and yet even though he's sitting among evil he's yet still righteous he's yet still loved he's yet still thought about pastor where you going with this see I, it doesn't matter what your address is it doesn't matter what church you go to it doesn't matter what your prayer life look like what matters is are you righteous enough even though you're in a sin filled environment some of us go to work every day and folks, folks are cussing on our jobs corruption is on our jobs and yet we're the remnant of righteousness and is somebody willing to come by and tell my story so somebody would get down on their face and get down on their knees and negotiate with God on my behalf. Maybe I slipped up and found myself in the bar one night, one afternoon, and maybe I found myself with Jack, Jim, or Johnny in my hand, but because I had it in my hand doesn't condemn me or make me a bad person. I was just having a bad moment. Are you willing to pray for me in my bad moment? Yes. Yes. But hold on, Abraham. Don't get beside yourself. Finding 50 good people in a large sinful city is hard. Maybe I'll lower the number and see what happens. Lord! Yes, Abraham? I am nothing in comparison to you. I'm merely a speck of dust in the wind on a windy day. So please forgive me for the question that I must ask you. Suppose you find 45 good people in it. Would you spare them when you destroy the city? If I find 45 good people, I will not destroy the city. <laughs> Lot finds himself in a bad place, but not a bad person. 
Lot finds himself, like many of us, surrounded by sin, but that doesn't mean we have to fall into the trappings of sin. Who was crying out to God in the first place? Who was the crying out to let God know what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? It had to be somebody righteous to say, Lord, would you come down and visit this place? What if that person was Lot that was crying out? As Here's what I'm saying. When you're in the atmosphere, are you crying out to God for deliverance? Are you crying out to God, save me from this? Are you crying out to God, Lord, just don't save me, but save my brother and save my sister. They, they're in the same predicament that I'm in, God. Huh? Or, or, or you've arrived already and you made your way to salvation. You've been baptized, but you forget once a little time ago, you were the one smoking weed. You were the one smoking the crack. You were the one in the whorehouse. You were the one in the bar. But somebody prayed for you. Suppose there are 40 good people in that sinful city. Even for them, I won't destroy the city. Have you forgotten that somebody prayed for you? Have you forgotten that somebody laid prayers in escrow for you? Have you forgotten that you weren't always a deacon. You weren't always the preacher. You weren't always the elder. No, you were on the other side of righteousness, but somebody decided to negotiate with God on your behalf. And we find Abraham having this relationship with God that he could negotiate with God. He didn't put a big number on God. He just said, if you can find 50, 50, Righteous, would you spare the city? Come on, think, Abraham, think. Please, Lord, don't be angry with me for asking you these questions. But what if there were 30 good people, people who do nothing wrong? Would you destroy them when you destroy the evil people? If I find 30 good people, I still won't destroy the city. Abraham knew that there was at least one righteous family in Sodom and Gomorrah. He was taking a chance on 40, but he knew there was a group that had his DNA. When's the last time you prayed for your wayward family member? When is the last time you prayed for that friend that you know really wants to get out of the lifestyle that they're in, but they can't see a way out, and they're being pulled in to this darkness of destruction, but you made it out. How are you reaching back and pulling them out? Are you interceding? Because Abraham wasn't perfect. He was just sanctified. He was righteous in the sight of God. He made intercession. He wasn't perfect. He was perfected, though by the relationship with God. Are you being perfected by God, for God, to do the will of God? Lord, I don't have the right to keep asking you these questions, but would you save the city if it was 20 good people in it? Because of that 20 good people, I will not destroy the city. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. One more note from the Lord and they're all saved. Lord, please don't be angry with me for asking you just one more question. Suppose you find 10 good God fearing people. You think you got saved just to get saved? You think you come to church just to come to church? You come to church for a purpose. It's not up here to shout. It's to get something, to take something back out to those streets that you can tell a dying world, Jesus Christ lives. Abraham used his relationship with God for someone other than his self. He was a type of Christ because 
sacrificially he went to God. Not knowing what the outcome was going to be, that he would negotiate with God. He finds himself standing boldly before God. He didn't think about, would God kill me? He didn't think about how God was going to think about me. No, he immediately put Lot in front of him. Who are you putting in front of you? He began to negotiate on behalf of his nephew. And I came by to beg you, ma'am, sir, who are you negotiating with God for? Sacrificially, he put his life on hold to put Lot's life in the front. Of God. For the sake of those ten, I will not destroy the city. I'm reminded of Jesus Christ, who put his life on an old rugged cross for me. I, I got to make it personal. I, I can't say you. He made it personal for me. And he didn't make it personal for Pastor Bumgarner. He made it personal for Earl Bumgarner. Because at the end of the day, I'm no different than you. I've got the same problems that you've got. I, I struggle with the same struggles that you struggle with. I, I've got to talk myself out of sin sometimes. But here's what I know. Somebody interceded. Somebody negotiated for me. Not yesterday. Not the day before. But somebody negotiated for me the day I was born on behalf of my sins. But prior to that, Jesus died before my mom and daddy even thought about conceiving me. Jesus died for my sins. He sacrificed for me. And I came by to ask you tonight, who are you willing to sacrifice for? Who are you willing to go to the cross for? Who are you willing to give up all who you are so they can become all God has for them? Are you willing to negotiate with God.